Well, good evening and welcome to our evening service at Grace Baptist Church in Perth. As you can see, we're still in the hut uh, this evening. Uh, we were able to meet once more at the Glen Eagles Day Centre in Perth as a congregation. It was fantastic to do that. It was a real blessing to be able to meet together and worship the God, the God that we all serve and love. Um, for the next few weeks, again, we will just be here on a Sunday evening. Um, now, we have had a few issues with our Sunday morning recordings. The sound hasn't been very good and we're working on that. So hopefully we will be able to put the last two sermons up online very soon. Um, but uh, bear with us for that. Um, and uh, hopefully my tech guy is working on that even as we speak um, today. I have a few announcements uh, for the church this evening. Um, there will be no um, virtual cafe this Wednesday for the ladies. Um, that's now going to run every two weeks. So it won't be this Wednesday, but it will be the following Wednesday. And that will be at half past seven on Zoom. Um, as we can see, things are starting to get back to normal and people are getting back to the work, etc. So half past seven uh, on Zoom for the ladies uh, virtual cafe and book club. Not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. That will resume again. This Thursday, again over Zoom and again at half past seven, uh, we will be having our, our um, prayer meeting and Bible study. We will continue to look at the subject of fasting and the believer. Uh, that's coming to an end. We've maybe got another two studies in that. Uh, this week we'll be looking at the book of Joel again. And we'll be looking at fasting and repentance. Fasting and repentance this Thursday night at half past seven uh, on Zoom. Next week again we hope to be meeting once more, the Lord willing, at the Glen Eagle Centre in Perth. And again if you're, if you're free, if you would like to come along, please come along and join us. Obviously, there are still the stipulations of social distancing and hand sanitizing, getting your hands cleaned and having your mask on. No congregational singing. But it would be great to see you if you had uh, the time to spend with us on next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. And then next Sunday evening, again, we will be uh, the same thing. We'll be in the hut uh, and recording the sermon itself. So <clears throat> as we come before the Lord uh, this evening, let's bow our heads and ask for his help. Um, as we come to his word and the preaching of his word. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence, we acknowledge the fact that you are an awesome God. You are a merciful God, a loving God, a long-suffering God. Heavenly Father, you show us mercy each and every day. And Lord, as we look out into your creation, we see your beauty and your majesty each and every day. And Heavenly Father, sometimes we wonder at how we can come into your presence into the presence of such a God as you. And yet, Lord, we are reminded in Scripture it is because of Christ. It is all because of Christ and his work upon the cross. Lord, it is because of that we can come into your presence and you will hear our supplications. You will hear the cries of the heart and you will hear and answer our prayers. Oh, Heavenly Father, we give you praise for that this morning or this evening. And Heavenly Father, as we... As we come to your word once more, Lord, we, we acknowledge what, what, a, what a treasure it is to us. So often we can neglect it. So often we can think we'll just maybe read it tomorrow. We'll have a day off almost. But Lord, it's such a treasure with so many gems in it, Lord. And we thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, how it directs our path. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it shows us Christ. It directs us to Christ. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that it shows your victory. It shows that in the end you will have victory and you will come back one day for your saints. And we thank you for that, Lord. What a wonderful promise to hold on to in a day like this. That, Lord, one day you will come through the sky to collect your church, your bride. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. What a wonderful promise and what a wonderful day to look forward to. But Heavenly Fathers, we're here on this earth right now. We're just pilgrims. We're just passing through. We understand. But Lord, we would just pray that you'll help us at this time. The times that we're living in are unusual. We've ha we haven't had to, to face these things before. But Lord, this, this evening we would just pray that you'll be with us to help us in each and every day that we face what we face. And Lord, we would just pray that you will use us at this time. That Heavenly Father... The, we acknowledge that you're shaking your church. We, we acknowledge you're shaking the believers. And Heavenly Father, we would ask that you would just shake us into life. 
that you'll be we, that we will be used by you used by you for your glory and to further your kingdom so heavenly fathers we come to your word this evening we would ask that you will just help us that you'll undertake for us and heavenly father as we as we listen and as we take in lord that you will just speak to us speak to each and every heart that is listening this evening be with each and every heart be with each and every family that is represented and heavenly father would you hear the cries of your people Heavenly Father, we look at our land, we look at our families, Lord, we would ask that you would save souls, even save souls tonight, Lord. Heavenly Father, that is our prayer. And we ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Now Joshua has taken, he's taken up the mantle of leader. He is commissioned by God, he was commissioned by God. And now in these verses that we are about to read, read, he actually commissions the nation. He tells them, prepare to possess the promised possession. That wasn't easy to say, but prepare to possess the promised possession. The spies had returned from their mission. Oper Operation Jericho has begun. The spies had told Joshua all that he needed to know. All that they had heard, all that they had saw, he come, they come back and they reported it back to their commander-in-chief. And tonight's reading, we will actually start at verse 24 in chapter 2. And then we will go back to verse 10 of chapter 1. So from chapter 24 of verse 2, just a one verse, and then we will go back to chapter 1 and verse 10. This is the word of the Lord. And he said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Now verse 10 of chapter 1. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions. For within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land. That the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember of the word of Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valour among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them. Until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it. The land that Moses the servant of the Lord gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. And he answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Amen. We'll end the reading there at the end of chapter one. So for the last two weeks, we've been looking at chapter two. We have seen the story of the spies. We've seen the wonderful redemptive story of Rahab. Now, as I said a number of weeks ago, really chapter two should be placed, um, should be placed after verse 9 and before verse 10 of chapter 1. And this is a style of Hebrew writing sometimes. And we can see examples of this style of writing in the Old Testament. One chapter will give you an overview. And then the next chapter will give you more details. It's a bit like the first chapter describing the forest. And then the next chapter will then describe a tree that is in that forest. So we've just read that the spies have come back. They've told Jer Joshua that Operation Jericho is a go. 
everything is ready. They, they go to Joshua and say, listen, we cannot fail. We cannot fail in this mission. And that's where we pick up the story this evening. And tonight I want to look at three points from these verses. The preparing, the remembering and the obeying. So the preparing, the remembering and the obeying. Excuse me. So with the information that the spies had gleaned, Joshua prepares the nation. First of all, he goes to the officers of the people. And we read that in verse 10. And notice something. He didn't consult with them. He didn't go looking to them for advice. The word that is used here is he commanded. He, he gave the order. And any good leader knows when the right time is to give a command. He also knows the right time to listen and consult. And Joshua here, God's chosen leader, knows that this is the right time to command. Now these officers are the leaders that were appointed in Deuteronomy in chapter 1. The nation's population was so numerous. They were beyond number at this point. And as a result of this, Moses by himself was not able to govern the nation. So he appointed men to help him lead. And in the scripture in Deuteronomy, it makes it clear what attributes these men should be or have. They had to have these attributes on display for all to see. They were to be wise. The knowledge that they had would, would be used, could be used as they led those people they were in charge of. They were to have understanding. They were, have, they were to have discernment, able to tell what was right and what was wrong. Able to judge those who, who, who were there in charge of. They had to be experienced men. Men whose charges those people who were under them would look to and would respect them because of their experience. This is who Joshua is commanding. And he tells them, go through the midst of the camp. Go into the middle of the camp that you're in charge of and tell the people, prepare, be ready, get everything in place. Everything that you need, make sure you have it. Because in three days, just three days, we will cross the Jordan. And we will cross the Jordan, take possession of the land that the Lord is giving to us. Listen, there's nothing worse than being unprepared for something. We can all testify to that. Being unprepared for an exam, being unprepared for a driving test. If that's the case, the likelihood is you will fail either your exam or your driving test. Being unprepared for a holiday. If you were to go camping and you didn't bring the right equipment and you didn't bring the right clothing. Then what a disaster that would be. Maybe you're driving up to the campsite and then you realise you haven't got the right camping tools, the right equipment, the right clothing. And you think, oh my goodness, how on earth are we going to be able to do this? In fact, I remember one year, my dad coming home, um, he had a perm and a tent, you know, a Kevin Keegan perm. I don't know if you remember one of those, but he had one of those and a tent that was probably 50 or 60 years old. He obviously spent more in his hair than he did actually hiring the tent for us that year. My, my dad may tell you these two things happened at different times, but we'll keep them there for the comedy effect of my dad having a Kevin Keegan haircut. But very soon... We were on our way up north for a camping holiday. And this was in the midst of summer. Now, those days, the summer actually lasted for more than one week in May. So this was really warm. And when we got to the campsite, everything seemed to, to be perfect. We had everything. We had enough clothes. We had the tent. It might have been old, but we had a tent. We had enough food. We had a stove to cook on. We got a good spot at the campsite. We were prepared for a great holiday. Absolutely. There was no doubt we were going to have a great time. But the one thing we weren't prepared for was the midges, the bugs, the beasties. They were everywhere because it was so warm. They were everywhere, inside the tent, outside the tent. Now, we did have to overcome this particular problem. I won't tell you how we did it because it's too embarrassing. But we weren't prepared really for the beasties. But, you know, being prepared is vital. It's vital in the world that we live in today. 
And it's certainly vital for the Christian to be prepared. We have to be prepared for the attacks of the devil because he will attack. That's why we are to put on the whole armour of God and be prepared to do the work that the Lord has called us to do, ready to be a witness for Christ in whatever situation he has put us into. But here the nation really had been preparing for 40 years. They, they'd been wandering in the wilderness and Joshua was with Moses as well. He was preparing there. So God was preparing them all for this time. And God made it clear to them once more that he is a promise keeping God. He had promised Abraham and all the forefathers. He had promised them this land. And now was the time that they had to possess it. Now, this wasn't their land because they deserved it. They hadn't done anything to be worthy of it. In fact, scripture tells us that there was not much to the nation. They, were, they weren't significant at all, actually. But God chose them. And he chose them because he loved them. And promised them. That this would be their land. And he would give it to them. He chose them. Because he loved them. So here. It really wasn't a case of. Let go and let God. Yes the people in Joshua. And all the leaders understood the promises of God. The promises of God. But yet. <clears throat> they themselves had to be prepared. The officers had to go through the camp and tell the people, prepare your provisions. This was going to be a long campaign. This wouldn't just be defeating Jericho and then everything else would fall into place. They had to prepare for a long battle. It was a long campaign. And they had to do this all within three days. They had to be ready within three days. And this probably shows us how well they were organised. They could do this literally at a drop of a hat. They were to be ready to be mobilised. And again, as I've said before, depending on who you read, the nation at this point is anything between one and a half million and four million people. And within three days, those people had to be ready. They had to break up camp. They had to prepare, make, pre prepare the livestock that they had, any cattle that they might have. They had to get the food ready for the campaign. No longer would, would there be manna provided when they entered the promised land. Joshua 5 verse 12 tells us this. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel. But they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. But also notice what Joshua actually didn't tell the officers to tell the people. This is something he didn't say. He didn't say, OK, we have three days to prepare and we can all see the River Jordan, the River Jordan in the distance that we're going to be crossing. And we can see that this river is at full flood. So get your boats ready. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say go and get them ready because you're going to have to row like you've never rowed before. No, he says, get your food ready, get your food ready. This is what an army marches on. The army needed to stay strong. There would be more than one battle, as I said. But a weak and a hungry army is an army that is already defeated. But also we need to see at this point that Joshua, Joshua is relying on God. He's relying on God. He's not relying on self here or of his plans that he has to cross the Jordan. He still knows that it is God who is going to give them this land. And if he has promised to give them this land, Joshua has faith that God will make a way possible. God has done it before at the Red Sea. Joshua knows that God can do the same again. Listen, and he still does that today. When we're in a situation, when we look around us and we think there's no way out of this situation, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Amen. Amen. He did it for Moses at the Red Sea. He's about to do it for Joshua at the River Jordan. Listen, this evening, he will do it for you. So often when we're in a situation, we rely on self. In a, and maybe in a crisis, we rely on self. But we need to learn a lesson here from Joshua. 
He could see the situation in front of him, as I said. He could see the river. He could see the problem. The problem was the river. Jordan was in full flow. But his faith was in God. Not his own ability to cross that river. Not his own brain to cross that river. His faith was in God. And he knew his God would make a way. I love Isaiah 42 and verse 16. It's a wonderful verse. It says this. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light. The rough places into level ground. These are the things I do. And I do not forsake them. Isn't that a wonderful verse? Wonderful portion of scripture. We could be blind. We could have lost our way. The flat ground that we once walked upon could have turned into a rough terrain. Rugged and too hard to climb. But God in this verse says, I will lead you. I will lead you. When, if it looks lost, I, I will guide you in paths. And these will be paths that you have not known before. I will turn the darkness that is all around about you and I will turn that darkness into light. And the rough path will be once more, it will be level. It will be smooth. And God says, these are the things that I do. These are the things that I do. And, and he will not forsake you. That's a wonderful verse of scripture. If you haven't already highlighted or underlined in your Bible, do it now. Because that is a wonderful verse of scripture. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things that I do, and I do not forsake them. And this is the God that Joshua knows. Is that the God that you know? I don't want to over-spiritualize this. But when you face your river Jordan, that obstacle, do you know, do you have faith that your God will make a way? Because if you don't, please read that verse again. As I said, highlight it. Do you know that God? The same God that Joshua knows. That leads us to our second point. The remembering. So we've had the preparing now the remembering. In verses 12 to 15, Joshua tells the leaders to go to the tribe of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half the tribe of Manasseh. And he told these, and, and tell these three tribes, well actually they're really, I suppose, two and a half tribes. But he said, they, they had to remember, remember the word that Moses commanded them. And please remember that these two and a half tribes have already received their inheritance. It was in the other side of the river. And we read that in the book of Numbers of this happening. But also Joshua tells these tribes to remember that there are conditionings, conditions to them receiving that inheritance early. And also look and remember that these actually, these tribes are receiving their inheritance outside the promised land it's not in the promised land it's in the other side of the Jordan and Joshua says you need to keep the promises that were made and that was to send their men their men of valor their fighting men they were to send them across the Jordan with the other tribes and they were to stand shoulder to shoulder with their brothers in arms they had to fight the battles together to possess the land and we read in Joshua chapter 22, it's recorded that that's exactly what they did in Joshua chapter 22. But notice something with me here. In the book of Numbers, I think it's in chapter, I think it's chapter one in the book of Numbers. It tells us that men of 20 years and over can be called into national service, as it were. Anyone over the age of 20, anyone old, older than 20 could be a man who would go to war that's who that's who had to go to war and as we look through the book of Joshua we see that these two and a half tribes if, if you can calculate it's over 130,000 men they have 
that are able to do that. That's a lot of men. It's over 130,000 of men to be able to do that. But as you read Joshua 4 and verse 13, well, we see that these two and a half tribes seem to only send 40,000 men. The rest of the men stayed this side of the river. They didn't cross the river into the promised land. They stayed this side of the river. They stayed to protect their family. They stayed to protect their livestock and their living. That's what seems important to them. Now scripture tells us and it's clear. If we follow Christ we must be prepared to forsake all. We need to as believers to be prepared to lose all. If we want to gain all. In a world that we live in today, people give up so much for so little. We see that every day. Young people give up their sleep for video games. Men give up their family time, time that they should really be spending with their children or time that they should be spending with their wives. They, they, they give that time up to just get a promotion and work. I'm trying to give up carbs to lose weight. But you know, in Philippians 3 and 7, it says this. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So many in the world today are not prepared to give up their perceived worldly pleasures, pleasures, the things that the world puts trust in. People don't want to give these things up, the material things, the money. They don't want to give up their money. They don't want to give up their houses or possessions. They don't want to give up their popularity. But people don't want to give these, think these things up. And they certainly don't want to do it in exchange for an eternal reward. They want instant gratification. They do not understand that Christ is worth giving up all for. They don't understand that. And tonight, are you holding on to something? Is there something stopping you from coming to Christ? Let me tell you, no matter what you think it is or how valuable you think it is, compared to the beauty and the majesty of Christ, it is rubbish. It is waste. You know, you could be living in a castle with a... 20 rooms, 20 bedrooms. You can have a million pound in your bank. Your everyday car that you take to the spa or the co-op or Tesco's could be a Bentley. Your weekend car could be a Ferrari or a Maserata, Maserati. But if you have not Christ, listen, you're a pauper. You're a pauper. These, mean things, these things mean nothing if you do not have Christ. Christ in, in Matthew 16 says, For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, if he gains the, world, the possessions of the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? But also in, in Joshua chapter 22, it says that, that these tribes did all according to what Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded them to do. So they did go with their brothers. They did not reject them or leave them. So that is good. We read that that's exactly what they did. There might have been only 40,000 of them, but that's what they did. But also in Joshua chapter 22, we see that these, these two and a half tribes cause a problem. And their problem is because they're living outside the promised land. They wanted this land. They looked at this land and they said, we want this. Because they saw it was good for their cattle. So they would have been able to raise their cattle on some lush ground. They would have been able to multiply their wealth because of it. Their possessions and their wealth would grow because of this land. It seems that they would rather have that than spend time in the promised land. Spend time in the promised land with their brothers and sisters from other tribes, from, with their nation. And because they're on the other side of the Jordan, other side of the promised land. They are far from the place of worship. I was reading in one commentary where a man called these tribes as borderline believers. I think that's a very apt description of the two and a half tribes. 
Yes, they had done everything that Moses had commanded them to do. And they'd kept the promises to Moses. They'd kept their promises to Moses. And yet when all was said and done, they wanted to be outside the promised land, on its borderline, close enough to have one foot in the promised land and close enough to have one foot outside of it. But that's what they wanted. And again, that's an example to us. It's a warning to us. So often in churches today, we see men and women who are prepared to come alongside for a period of time and they want to help. They roll up their sleeves, as it were. They get their hands dirty. And, and they do a real work for the Lord. They come alongside the church. They come alongside other believers. And they serve Christ. They serve Christ in the proclamation of the gospel. But they do this for a short period of time. And when the work is done, when that job is finished, they head back from where they came. They go back to their own place. And to their own comfort. Listen, today... The church, the church of Christ needs men and women who are prepared, prepared to forsake, to forsake, forsake all for Christ. They need to forsake the promise of living outside of the promised land. They need to, to do a work for the Lord, forsaking all. They need to be committed to the Lord and the work that he has called them to do. Lynn has a saying. She says, if you want something done, ask a busy person. It's probably maybe one you know yourself. And that's like the church today, isn't it? The work of the Lord is left to a few. Just a small few. When we all should be busy for his kingdom. Because we've all been called to serve the Lord. This was the problem of the two and a half tribes. They were outside the promised land. That leads us to our third and final point of this evening. The obeying. The obeying. Look at what the people say in verse 16. All that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. They will do and they will go. Now some commentators would say that this is a two and a half tribe saying this. But I believe scripture here tells us that this is the leaders of the tribes that are saying this the leaders that Joshua addresses in verse 10 and this is a wonderful sentence of commitment now none of these leaders or, or these officers were thinking for themselves they weren't thinking about themselves thinking you know what actually I could sabotage this at this point and, and, and then maybe I would be able to take over the role that Joshua has I could maybe be able to become the leader of the nation no this is a commitment to God's servant and to God. And this is what we really should see in each and every church. Listen, I, I must admit, I, I've been blessed. And I really mean that. I've been blessed with my congregation. I've only been in this church for six months. But I can honestly say that they are an example of what we're reading in this verse. But that can't be say, said for all churches. So often, pride gets in the way of obedience, doesn't it? Listen, when you see a young child, a baby, and you see the mother and father, you know, Googling over this child, and they're trying to coax that child to say mama or, or dada. And so often, that's one of the first words that will come out of the mouth of that child. It will be mama or dada. But not far off the heels of that word is a word that every child learns very quickly. And that is no no from a very early age they are disobedient to their parents they're told don't eat those cookies don't put your hand in the cookie jar no don't hit your brother i'll put that in for my sister there don't hit your brother say no i'll hit him if i want go to bed no and even today in the church it seems that so-called christians pick and choose what they can be obedient to we're even seeing this at this particular moment in time with this pandemic. How some are saying we must not be obedient to the rulers of our land. Some are saying we shouldn't have to wear masks. We should be able to sing. And I'm talking about the UK here. Then there are others who say that we have to obey the government of our land. And they quote Romans 13 to us. But here Joshua tells the officers... Go to the people, get them prepared to possess the land that God has given to them. 
And the officers turn to Joshua and say, yes, we will do everything that you have commanded us to do. Now, Joshua isn't being abusive in his power here. He's not insecure in the position that he holds and therefore overstretches his power. No. He has been chosen by God. The officers see this. He has been equipped by God to lead. The officers see this and they obey. Scripture tells us in James chapter 1 and verse 22 that we're not only just to be hearers of the word of God, but we are to be doers of that word. We are to obey the word of God. And we do that because we love him. We obey the word of God because we love him. You know, we don't just cherry pick. You know, we are commanded to do all that the word of God tells us to do. God's word should be our standard. But it's a standard today that's being marginalised. It's a truth that's being marginalised. And we are told that when we preach from God's word or we quote God's word, well then we're just bigots. And what we're saying is just full of hate. But you know, we are to be like Peter, the apostle Peter in the book of Acts. Do you remember when he's brought before the council and the high priest tells the apostles and Peter, you're not to teach his name. You're not to teach the name of Christ. Stop it. You fill Jerusalem with his teaching. Stop it. But what did Peter answer him? We must obey God rather than men. Yes, God has put governments in, in place and we are to obey them. But if their laws and their edicts that they pass down are contrary to the commandments of Scripture, then we need, we need to, to obey God rather than man. And this is what these officers are doing. They're looking to Joshua. Yes, he's a man, but they know he has been equipped. They know he has been chosen. They know he's been called by God. And they say, where, we go, where you go, we will go. What you tell us to do, we will do. They're obedient. So very quickly in conclusion, this is a wonderful portion of scripture that so often we can just skip over but we can learn so much from it. We are to be prepared. How often do we pray for something, for example? We pray for something, something specific. And the Lord answers that prayer. Graciously and wonderfully, he answers that prayer. And yet, we're not prepared for that answer. We're not prepared to take a step in faith because of that answer. We almost go back into our shell again. And we pray again for a confirmation. Listen. As, as Christians, we need to be prepared for answered prayer, for a call to do God's work. We need to be prepared. We also need to be obedient. Obedience today seems to be, or disobedience today seems to be the order of the day, doesn't it? If you don't get what you want, cause chaos. Cause a commotion if you don't get what you want. Be angry. Tell people about it. Say you want to get your way. But as a Christian, we are to be obedient to our government, to our church leaders, but above all, God and his word. That's what we are to be obedient to, God and his word. We are also to remember, we're called to remember. Listen, we have many things to remember and we have many things to remember and give thanks for, don't we? Remember the promises in scripture that God has kept. Remember the answers to prayer that he has given. Remember that God keeps you securely in his hand. And remember that God will never leave you nor forsake you. We have much to remember and give praise to God for. Listen, if you're unsaved this evening, I want you to remember one thing. If you die in your sin, if your sin has not been forgiven, and I don't mean forgiven by a man or a priest because it can't be forgiven by a man or a priest. But if your sin has not been forgiven by the blood of Christ, then I want you to remember, I want you to remember this, that if you die in that sin, then there will be a great gulf between you and Christ, a gulf greater than the Red Sea, a gulf greater than the River Jordan, because you will be in an eternal hell 
with no hope for parole, no hope of an exit, a gulf fixed for all eternity. You know, tonight, Scripture tells you, call upon the name of the Lord, that you may be saved. Turn from your sin. Christ has bridged that gulf. He has made a way for you to be in the presence of a thrice holy God. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we just we thank you for your word this evening. We thank you for the, the lessons that we can learn from the book of Joshua. Heavenly Father, with it, we must be prepared. As, as Christians, Heavenly Father, we need to be prepared for what you would have us to do, where you would have us to go. Heavenly Father, we are to remember all the promises that you've kept, how you keep us and you never leave us and you never forsake us. And Heavenly Father, that we are to obey, to obey you and your word. Not to cherry pick, not just to pick the easy things, but Heavenly Father, every jot and tittle that we find in your word, we are to obey. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to do these three things. That we may be a witness for you. That we may glorify you. That we may exalt you in our words and our deeds. And Heavenly Father, again, if there is anyone this evening who is listening to this and who is not saved, Heavenly Father, we would pray that the Spirit of God will just work in their lives. Heavenly Father, it can only be the Spirit of God to work in their lives. Heavenly Father, so often you can use man, man or a woman as a vessel, but it is all of God. Salvation is all of God. And we would just pray this evening, Lord, that you will do a work in many people's lives. And we ask these things again in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you for joining with us this evening. We do pray that you've been blessed and helped this evening's by this evening's word stay with us as we uh, continue uh, the service for another five or so minutes as with an item of worship uh, the words will come up on screen and you will be able to to sing along and praise our god together even though we're in different places and different rooms and different houses we still will be able to praise the lord together as a body of believers and again as i said thank you for joining with us and if you can join with us next week once more we just do pray that the lord will bless you in the coming week thank you Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his